both extension and research responsibilities. His specific areas are include wildlife habitat relationships and the role of disturbance to maintain sustainable ecosystems and social constraints to conservation. So please help me welcome Dr. Elmore. Thank you. Good morning. Is that volume about right or is that too loud? Is it okay? All right, good. So it's a pleasure to be here this morning and uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about the predators of some of these pollinators, birds. And uh, I'd like to acknowledge the co-authors here, specifically Tori Hovick, who was a PhD student that collected uh, this data on the Tallgrass Prairie Preserve in northern Oklahoma, which is the southern extent of the Flint Hills. Although, just to be contrary, Oklahomans call it the Osage Hills, but it's the same ecosystem, the same plant community. And I'm going to talk about uh, three kind of groups of birds. First, just greater prairie chickens. Obviously, it's a species of uh, high conservation concern, kind of the canary in the coal mine, so to speak, for the uh, tall grass prairie ecosystem. So it's one that there's a lot of concern about, um, its decline, although we hear a lot more about lesser prairie chicken, greater prairie chickens are in significant, have significant issues. They've been absent from most of their distribution for a very long time, and the Flint Hills is kind of one of the last strongholds. Then I'm going to talk about breeding birds in general, the passerines uh, the, uh, that occur in the, the Flint Hills, and then lastly, a winter bird community, which is grossly understudied grasslands globally, including the uh, tallgrass prairie system. This was part of a large USDA funded project, Department of Agriculture. Tory was only one student on this project, also Brady Allred, who focused on livestock, and uh, both bison and domestic cattle. And then Terry Becerra, who was a postdoc that did a lot of social work, uh, landowner perceptions, agency perceptions about heterogeneity. So I'm talking a lot about heterogeneity in this presentation, but just so you know, the way we created heterogeneity in this project is through fire and grazing. So when I'm talking about heterogeneity, it's, it's prescribed fire that's really driving this system. And historically, we know that's what was happening. Uh, you need three things for a fire to occur. Uh, fuel, o oxygen, and an ignition source. And obviously in a grassland system there is tremendous amounts of fine fuel. So it was a very fi fire prone landscape and historically we had lots of large ungulates running around. We've largely replaced those with the domestic bison, but by and large in the tall grass, uh, or in the Flint Hills at least, the system is, is quite similar to what it probably historically looked like, although we've drastically changed the fire regime as, as uh, Shelley indicated. And you've probably seen this slide before, I think it's really interesting because it shows we've done a pretty good job in the United States of coming out of this down cycle for wetland birds and kind of stabilized forest birds uh, across the United States, but birds that occur in rangelands, so deserts, shrublands, grasslands, they're, they've tanked and really that has not picked up through all of our conservation efforts. They are grossly below um, w the numbers that were in the 1970s and the, probably they've fallen way before we started monitoring. The, this, for a lot of these species they were probably declining since the 1930s. Some of them maybe before that. We know Bob White as an example uh, was mentioned in the early 1930s as a bird of significant decline across the eastern U.S. So for some of these species that occur in rangelands, the, the decline has been long term and is not turned around. So we talk a lot about how do we uh, fix these systems that we've altered and one of the ways is to try to get this fire and herbivory linked back on, on the landscape, create heterogeneity, variability in plant structure and composition, um, and you know, you, there's different ways of doing that. Uh, patch burn is one way that some folks are investigating. So we set out to do a study to really see, okay, how does this restored fire uh, grazing heterogeneity system, how does it actually affect grassland birds? We think, we hypothesize that it would be beneficial, but in the Great Plains, Southern Great Plains particularly, does it actually help these species? Are there higher abundance? Um, are they drawn to these sites? How do they use the landscape? And at what point does it become, does our heterogeneity become actually fragmentation to these species? 
So the, as I said, the three areas I'm going to fo focus on are greater prairie chicken and then just breeding bird passerines and winter bird passerines. So the Tallgrass Prairie Preserve, most of you are probably familiar with, some of you have probably been there. It's a quite a large Nature Conservancy property that uh, is very well managed with a, a lot of different uh, fire seasons and, and, and fire sizes. And this picture on the right, uh, all the different colors just illustrates different times since fires. Just to show you that it's a very uh, mosaic landscape, uh, a, lot, a lot of uh, different times since fires, uh, different plant compositions and structures that result from a variable fire regime. So first, greater prairie chickens. The areas that we wanted to investigate was nest site selection, nest survival, thermal habitat or thermal environment, and I'll talk a little bit more about that because that may be novel to some of the audience, and then lex site selection. Obviously, lex are the areas where the males congregate in the spring to attract females for breeding. So I'm not going to go deep at all into methodology. I want to get straight to the results. If you'd like to know anything about how we collected this data, I'll have citations at the end that you can jot down, or I'd be happy to talk to you afterwards. But for the nest site selection, we use resource selection functions. And we were really looking at things like time since fire, anthropogenic structures, that's roads, power lines, oil and gas wells, houses, et cetera, tree cover. We suspected that was a big driver of where chickens were and mostly where they're not. Uh, and then, of course, distance to lek. There's a lot of site fidelity, particularly with the males, to the lecking areas. So what did we find? Well, there was really three things that were driving where nest sites were. Remember, this, these are nest site locations. Time since fire, uh, lek, distance to lek, and tree cover. So <clears throat> when the, if it's above zero, so the positive values, means that they are uh, basically maximizing. If it's below zero, it means they're minimizing. So what this tells you is their, mac their ne nest sites are in areas that are, have the maximum time since fire. So in this landscape, that's two or three years post-fire. So m the vast majority of the nests were in areas that had not been burned in a couple of years. They strongly avoided tree cover they minimized the amount of tree cover on the landscape. So they were avoiding trees, favoring areas that uh, had not been burned for a couple years. Now that automatically throws up a little bit of a conundrum. So they use fire, and for the first year or two, they're not going to nest there, but you have to have fire to keep trees off the landscape. So that tells you that you need fire on the landscape to keep it a grassland, but not all the grassland can be burned in a single year if you're trying to increase nesting cover for prairie chickens. So it just points to the need for heterogeneity that yes, fire is critically important for prairie chickens to keep prairies, but if the whole landscape is burned, nest, and out, and nest site uh, selection and survival is going to be uh, really poor. And of course, they did also minimize distance to leks. That's not surprising. The leks are there not because it's any magic place in the world. It's, Usually the leks are located where there's just suitable habitat. So where there's few trees and suitable nesting cover nearby, that's where the leks are. So when we look at nest survival, and this is on 47 nests, again we looked at management, fire, anthropogenic structures, and also weather. We found that nest survival increased with greater vegetation height. So this is corresponds to the greater time since fire. Uh, biomass increases, the plant height increases, and not only were nests chosen to be in those areas, but nest survival was strongly correlated to taller vegetation. It also decreased with greater solar radiation. What this means is on days with higher solar radiation values, the chance of a nest failing was higher. Now, solar radiation and, and vegetation height are correlated, but what we're seeing here is that the birds are selecting areas with tall vegetation for cover, and we usually think predation cover, but it's more than just predation cover, it's also thermal cover. It's shielding the hen that has to sit there virtually all day long in the blazing sun. It's shielding her from the direct influence of the sun. So when it's 100 degrees outside and you're in the sun, it's not really 100 degrees. It can be 140 degrees felt temperature to you because that's what we call operative temperature. 
It's the difference in being in the shade when it's 100 and being in the sun when it's 100. The felt temperature, the operative temperature, is quite different. So the shade that this vegetation provides, we, when we saw this, we thought, well, that's probably pretty important, so let's try to quantify exactly how that's working. So put up these little nifty solar, or these uh, temperature probes, these black spheres, which absorb solar radiation, but they also absorb the ambient temperature, and they also are cooled by wind. So it's a good approximation of what an organism, in this case a chicken, might feel if it was exposed to certain places on the landscape. And we put these all over the preserve in different times since fires, in different slopes, in different aspects. We put them on nest sites, both successful and unsuccessful nests. And we really tried to quantify what the, the landscape looks like in terms of temperature. This is just the raw data plotted. And what I want you to see is there's a lot of options for an organism. At a given ambient temperature, let's say it's 30 degrees Celsius, the operative temperature, that's closer to what you would actually feel, not just what the thermometer says, but what the organism is actually feeling. The operative can range anywhere from actually cooler than ambient, maybe down to like 27 C, all the way up to 50 degrees Celsius. That's a huge range at a given ambient temperature. So this range represents thermal options for an animal. When we actually looked at where nests were, we found that on average, they were in locations that were four to eight degrees cooler than the average conditions at the landscape level. Even at really small scales, like in the distance of a footstep, the temperature was four degrees difference. So the chickens were not only selecting patches that tended to be cooler, and we can't say they were selecting for the cooler temperature. They could have been selecting for something else that was just correlated with temperature, but they were selecting for patches that were cooler, and they were selecting for sites at very small scales that were cooler. Did that actually make any difference for nest success? Yes, it did, particularly when it got hot. So successful nests were actually six degrees cooler on average than unsuccessful nests. So again, we can't say that the chicken is perceiving this temperature and making decisions based on temperature. It could be purely vegetation that they are selecting for, but it is strongly correlated with temperature and both the solar radiation and the operative temperature would tend to suggest that that is a big driver of nest success and that's all related to vegetative cover and time since fire. So, so far the picture paints that you've got to have fire to keep it a prairie, but not too much fire because you've got to have vegetation cover to shield the nest. But let's, take, let's take this a little bit further. So, lex. We know lex are important. There's a lot of fidelity to lex. These lex actually move around, at least in landscapes where disturbance moves around. So we decided to, again, do resource selection function and look at some of these same covariates to see what's driving lex site selection. Similar to the earlier figure, if it's above zero, that shows they are uh, maximizing. If it's below, they're minimizing. So the big drivers uh, are usually the lex are on tall elevated portions. Why would that be? Well, the males want to be heard and they want to be able to see. So they're usually on ridge tops, not down in swells. The other big one to look at is woody cover. The leks are strongly avoiding tree cover, again pointing to the fact that fire on the landscape to keep it open prairie is critically important for where chickens choose to be in the world. But we also saw this fire patch edge interaction. So if, you had, if a lek happened to be located in a prairie patch that had been unburned for a year or two, they tended just to be on, you know, random places, ridge tops, uh, mineral uh, boxes around ponds, bare, somewhere where it's bare ground and elevated and of course away from trees. But when that landscape was burned, oftentimes the lek would actually move to the edge of the patch. So those males that had been there, let's say in 2015, and then you have a fire in 2016, they typically would shift to the edge. So they would still be in, the, they would be in that burn unit perhaps, but they would generally pull back to cover, which tells you something about the need for cover. They need cover for nesting. The males also need cover to duck into 
when a harrier or a prairie falcon comes after them on the lake, rather than being out in the middle of maybe a 500 or 1,000 acre burn where it's a long ways to fly to get to cover, they would just pull off the edge. They still want to be in the open, but close enough that they can bail out if trouble occurs. Now, I don't have time to talk about brooding today, but just so you know, this is kind of the whole take-home message of what we found with chickens in this landscape. They're generally nesting in areas that haven't been burned in a couple years. They're generally lacking in areas that have recently been burned or otherwise is pretty uh, minimal cover, but near cover. They're brooding in the intermediate, the four bridge areas. So they're using the entire landscape for different parts of their life history. So if you want to know what's wrong with chickens in the Flint Hills, it should be clear. The whole world can't look the same. It can't all be forest. In fact, from a chicken standpoint, forest is of probably no value. They might use it a little bit in the winter for foraging on acorns, but that's about it. But it also can't all be burned in the same year, or your nest production is going to be dismal. In fact, I didn't show it here, but um, we had a few birds nest in the year of burn. 100% failure. Unless it was a second nest. We had a few re-nests that occurred like way into June that were in the year of burn, and a few of those made it. But by then, the vegetation had partially recovered and there was cover again. But all first nests that were in year of burn, and there weren't many, all failures. And we think that has a lot to do with high temperatures, not just predation events. Okay, let's switch gears to migratory birds, particularly species that breed in the Flint Hills. So we set up a lot of, of transects and uh, sampled those transects four times per breeding season over three years. These yellow lines are actually all the transects. These are the cattle pastures. So this is the cattle portion, not the bison portion of the Tallgrass Prairie Preserve. And we were really trying to look at how does heterogeneity driven by fire influence breeding bird uh, st diversity, stability, and individual species response. And we tried to create this gradient. Uh, Bob Hamilton and the guys at TNC are just wonderful to work with. I can't say enough about that place. Uh, that created this incredible landscape uh, spectrum that is difficult to repeat most places of the world, where basically we have these pastures that range from all burn, the entire pasture was burned, which is typical of a lot of the Flint Hills currently, all the way up to these eight patch pasture, pastures, really a patchy landscape. So we're trying to see, can it get too patchy for some of these species? And how much fire um, is really needed? So we had a lot of detections, over 5,000 individual detections from 35 different bird species. However, bird diversity in the southern, southern Flint Hills, southern Tallgrass Prairie is actually pretty low during the breeding season. There's lots of birds, the abundance is high, but species numbers are quite low because 94% of all those detections were five species. Eastern meadowlark, Dick Sissel, Upland Sandpiper, Grasshopper Sparrow, and Henslow Sparrow. And a couple of those are species of pretty significant concern, Henslow and Upland Sandpiper. Straight to the data, this is what it looked like. All right, so on the, the y-axis, we're going from low to high abundance, and on the landscape side, the x-axis, low to high heterogeneity. So this would be like the burn it all and burn a portion, but something every year. And you see that the trends varied a little bit, but in general, there was a strong trend for all really but one species, Dick Sissel, which kind of peaked at this intermediate heterogeneity level. All the other species were trending towards increased numbers as we increased heterogeneity, made it more patchy. In fact, we didn't get it patchy enough, evidently, even at eight patches. The greatest uh, densities for all the species were, were, were in these landscapes with greater than three year fire return intervals. So as we increase the number of patches, the, the bird diversity increased, and as I said, evidently eight 
wasn't the threshold. It's probably something beyond that. We don't know where it is. That's just as high as we went in this study. And this is a little bit of a confusing figure, so let me walk you through it. Um, basically, this decreased line indicates that as the number of patches increased, the stability of the bird community stabilized. So stability increased. So what that means is if you're in a landscape with one patch, you either burn it all or you don't, the species turnover from year to year is tremendous. Like in one year, you may have a lot of upland sandpipers. The next year, you may have none. So tremendous turnover in species. But in the landscapes that had a lot of patchiness, the overall diversity was, was, it was very stable. They might be using different patches in that landscape, but the landscape as a whole was providing something for all those birds. What does that mean? It means that, again, the whole world shouldn't look the same if you value species diversity. By providing this heterogeneity in the landscape, we've got patches that all these species can use, and they move around and find the appropriate patch in space and time. Okay, winter birds. Harder to do. Um, Density is quite low. They're often flocked up. You have to walk miles and miles of transects to get enough detections to say anything, which is probably why not many people have studied wintered birds in grasslands. Um, Tori, um, he, he walked a lot. 20, 24 different transects that were 500 meters, and they were sampled four times per year for three years. And those are the transects. A lot fewer detections. 345 detections as compared to over 5,000 detections during the breeding season. However, a detection is often a flock, so one detection might be 200 birds. Okay, but for the analysis, you just enter it in as a single detection. Only 14 species of birds detected, so even lower species diversity, um, or richness rather, during the winter time. And these species are, as you can see, uh, Henslow, uh, Tree Sparrow, um, we've got met Metalarks again, um, Pippets, and Leconte Sparrow, which is another species of high conservation concern. Both, both uh, Smith's Long Spur and Leconte Sparrow are, are really uh, in trouble and are species that are, are on the radar as far as significant declines. So this shows you the months post disturbance. So this is basically the year of burn up to two years and greater than two years burn. And a couple of the species were actually didn't show significant relationships. They were in all the patches. They were kind of just everywhere ubiquitous and, and those were um, the Savannah Sparrow and the Meadowlark which are not surprisingly uh, doing pretty well. We have a lot of eastern metal larks and we have lots of savanna sparrows. It's a very common bird in the United States. However, when you look at um, Smith's long spur, which is one that's in trouble, we find that they actually preferred the recently disturbed patch, which makes sense when you think about the ecology of the species. It breeds um, on the edge of the boreal into the tundra. It favors very open landscapes with very little ground cover not only in the breeding season, but also during the, the uh, wintering season. On the opposite end of the spectrum is this Leconte Sparrow, which was completely absent in patches that had been burned that year. It was only in patches that had cover and strongly favored patches that hadn't been burned in two years. So this picture tells us similarly that if you want all of these winter bird species on the landscape, the landscape should be variable. It shouldn't all look the same. And when you plot all of these species on a spectrum, this is what our data shows. That to have all of these wintering birds, you've got to have all of these different configurations of vegetation structure and composition that run the gamut of time since fires. Everything from Sprague's Pippets and Smith's, uh, Sprague's Pippet is one that's probably going to get listed in our uh, within the next decade probably on the endangered species list. It's, it's in, this bird is, I mean, it's on the brink. It's in really bad shape. And it turns out the Flint Hills is a really important place for it, for it, wintering distribution. And it actually favors recently burned areas, as does Smith's long spur. But Leconte Sparrow, on the other end of the spectrum. And this is really similar to probably a figure that a lot of you have seen from Fullendorf back in 2009 for the breeding birds. <laughs> 
with the Kildare Lark Sparrow on one end and the Henslow Sparrow on the other end of the spectrum. So what are our conclusions? Fire and grazing interactions uh, do lead to landscape heterogeneity and this uh, time and space uh, application of disturbance, it changes where uh, prairie chickens choose to be on the landscape for different parts of their life history. Most of the uh, breeding bird species that we monitored increased in abundance as we increased heterogeneity. So they were at the lowest levels in the landscapes that were the most homogeneous. The landscapes that were just burned all at once had the lowest total abundance and also the lowest diversity of those birds. Further, the increase in the heterogeneity made that bird population more stable over time. There wasn't as much species turnover from year to year. And similar to the breeding birds, the winter bird communities showed different selection for different times since fires, different patches, um, indicating that to have all of those birds on the, in, in the grassland, you need to have some variety in, in, in management and, and different times since fire and grazing. So I guess in conclusion to our initial question, for the tall grass prairie, at least the southern Great Plains portion of the tall grass prairie, it appears that restoring heterogeneity does in fact, uh, uh, is an, in fact an effective strategy for grassland bird conservation. You'll note that there's a lot of other birds that occur in this system that I didn't talk about that we don't consider grassland birds like bobwhite. Um, it's a shrub obligate that happens to occur um, in the Flint Hills, but it's strongly tied to woody vegetation. And there's a lot of other uh, wintering sparrows that are similarly tied to woody vegetation that I didn't talk about. I'm talking about specifically grassland obligate species, those that have to have grass. Bobwhite have to have shrubs. So that's why some of the birds you might be thinking about aren't on this list. A big thank you to the burn crew and led by Bob Hamilton, who's sitting in the audience. I'll shoot you with a laser, Bob. And uh, we couldn't have done this without them. Um, it's really great to have a landscape like this to, to work in. And um, we can ask big scale questions that I think are, are relevant not only to conservation, but relevant to landowners. So if you'd like to know further information, here are the publications off this research. And then at the bottom, um, you can go to this website and find out what we're doing currently, our current graduate projects, and then feel free anytime to email me if you have any questions. I'd be glad to talk to you. Do we have time for questions now? We have a few minutes. Anybody have any questions for Dr. Elmore? Yes, sir. Can I use a microphone? I'm not sure you need it. <laughs> Short-eared owls. Yes, sir. Yeah, they, they do occur. Short-eared owls is the question. They do occur in that part of the world. Uh, and we did detect like one or two. But the densities are so low, we really couldn't statistically say anything about them. Um, they, I can tell you anecdotally, because there's almost nothing published in the southern Great Plains, there, there's research in the northern Great Plains where they breed. But on the wintering grounds, I'm not aware of any pubs um, off the top of my head. But I can tell you anecdotally, they roost, day roost, are, are um, typically in tall vegetation. Something hadn't been burned in a couple years and then they forage at dusk and dawn and into the night. And they seem to not have a strong preference, as best I can tell, about what they forage over. But you know, a lot of that foraging is taking place when I can't see. So that's, I would have not a lot of confidence in where they forage. But as far as where they roost, they seem to strongly prefer tall vegetation. Other questions? Yes, sir. Oh, yep. Yeah, the question was, how do we detect nests for greater prairie chickens? Yeah, we had VHF uh, transmitters, um, radio tr transmitters. We're currently still working on that landscape, and we're using satellite transmitters at this point, which gives you, you can answer a whole new set of questions with satellite telemetry, but we had VHF where we'd go out, usually get a location on a bird every day, and nests were monitored daily from a distance. Yeah, absolutely. The question was, with the telemetry, can you kind of determine when they're starting to zero in on a nest site? You can. It's a lot easier with the satellite telemetry because we're getting about 12 to 15 locations a day. 
But even with the VHF, you start to see this localizing behavior like the home range starts really shrinking down. And we see that with turkey, uh, with quail, you know, lots of galliforms uh, that do the same thing. Their home range starts shrinking down, and then all of a sudden, you know, you've got all the locations stacked up on one point. Yeah. And it can be a quite a long period where that's happening. You know, sometimes we'll go two or three or more weeks where they're localized and like, okay, any day now, any day now, and you know they're laying eggs, and in some cases they may have already completed their clutch. I don't know if they're waiting on the appropriate conditions or what, what, what the holdup is, but sometimes it's a long period uh, when they've had ample time to uh, complete a clutch. And you know, I don't know if they're delaying uh, laying or if they're just delaying incubation. We don't usually know what's going on there, but, but they kind of get in a holding pattern for several weeks usually before they actually start incubating. Other questions? Bob can correct me if I'm wrong, but I believe there were a few patches that were even four years, but what, Bob, 90 plus percent would have been burned by three years? Is that fair? So not a lot past four years. Yes, sir. That's correct. But, um, you know, the, uh, so I gave this similar presentation in Minnesota last year at the Wallace Society meeting, and somebody, and it was a great question, they said, well, if I just look at that figure, it would seem that maybe we shouldn't burn. I said, well, the, the flip side is, if you don't burn, these landscapes convert to woodland, and then all of these species disappear. They're grassland obligates, so there is a balancing act, you know, fire, is the only thing that keeps it grassland, but at some point, if the whole landscape is burned, there's no cover. Let's give Dr. Elmore a round Thank of applause. I think he'll be here for a little bit, answer a few more questions with us.